Well, good morning. It's so great to be with you all today. Um, I do want to say thank you to Jamie Johnson for inviting me. It's so wonderful. I've, I've never been to Oregon before, and so I'm so glad that my first time here is at George Fox. So thank you. You all have a lot of coffee shops, um, like a lot of them, and it's, it's wonderful. Um, I'm one of those coffee enthusiasts, and in my town we have like Starbucks and then my coffee shop. So that's about it. I would love it here. Um, if I'm honest, I was, I, was, I was struggling to figure out what to say with you all this morning. And the tension came because I, I felt pulled between what I thought was a really dynamic message and then what I was called to say. And as I was working on that talk that I thought was so great and I was so proud of, I felt God saying, Kate, I didn't call you to be a speaker. I gave you a message. Preach the message. So that's what I'm going to attempt to do this morning. What is it that I feel God has called me to tell you? We are living in a really interesting time. And I don't mean that in a lot of ways that people say it these days, as in our culture, although that's probably true. And I, I don't mean it as the prevalence of technology, because like you, I grew up with most of everything we have, and I'm really used to it. And I certainly don't mean to come here and talk about how the millennials are ruining everything, because I am a millennial, and I think we're pretty awesome. <laughs> what I mean is that we are living in an interesting time, because we find ourselves today in the Christian church in the middle of a three-decade-long debate on the role and place of women. And on one side, you have uh, what's called complementarian theology, and that holds that God made men and women equal, but that he intended for them to have different roles and responsibilities. And those roles mean that men will always be in authority over women, and women will always be in its submission to men. It means that women will never hold positions of leadership in the church, at least over men. It means that, that all wives must submit to the authority of their husbands. And they use words like biblical manhood and biblical womanhood. They talk a lot about gender roles. And on the other side of the debate, you have egalitarian theology, which teaches that God made men and women to be equal, and that positions of leadership in the church are not determined by gender, but by gifting and calling. Egalitarians believe that husbands and wives are called to mutual submission to one another in marriage. And we believe that, that the Bible doesn't tell one definition of manhood and one definition of womanhood, but that the Bible tells lots of different stories of different men and women who had different gifts and who God used to do amazing things for his people and his kingdom. And you and I find ourselves in this debate that has been going on continuously for at least three decades, not the first time it's been mentioned in church history, but the debate is alive and kicking today. And it's confusing to a lot of us. We don't quite know where to stand. We don't quite know what to believe. Because we have churches that we grew up in that fall on one side or the other. We have families that we've grown up in that fit in one definition or the other. We have friends and, and loved ones who who take a stance, and we, we listen to sermons by popular evangelical pastors that seem to fit on one side or the other, and it gets really confusing. And words are thrown around a lot like slippery slope and low view of scripture and feminism. And that's scary, because if we enter into that debate, those terms could be applied to us. So a lot of times we are scared and we step back and we leave it for others to talk about. But for us in the church, this debate has already had profound implications on our theology, on our view of God, on our view of each other, on relationships, especially across gender lines and in marriage. This debate has already had profound implications on what the church teaches how God will move in his people. And I believe that this very topic will probably affect all of you in the careers you choose to take in the marriages you choose to enter into, and in the, in the things that you think God will and will not call you to in your life. And those are profound things. I myself have struggled with this debate. From eighth grade through college, I was, I was seeking answers, I was asking questions, because more than anything, I wanted to honor God with my life. And as a woman, in the middle of this debate, how am I gonna do that? 
I mean, I was naturally outgoing and sporty and loud. <laughs> I was drawn to positions of leadership in my church and youth group and at my school. I didn't babysit. I didn't have any sort of natural ability with children. So even at a young age, I didn't fit into what a lot of people thought was biblical womanhood. Was I created wrong? So I poured over books, and I studied, and I prayed, and in that honest quest for truth, I came to believe personally that God created men and women to be fully equal. I came to believe that the, the gifts of the Spirit are not given to, to disciples based on their gender. I came to believe that, that that culture in the church that focuses on male authority over women misses the point of a God that said, to be first in the kingdom, you should be last, and to be greatest, you need to be the servant of all. I came to believe that instead of making a hierarchy among God's people based on gender or race or socioeconomic class, we should be recognizing the words of Galatians 3.28, that in Christ there is neither slave nor free, male nor female, Jew nor Greek, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. In other words, I came to believe what George Fox believed. I came to believe what this very institution holds to be true. And this school that you all attend, as you know, is part of the Quaker movement, which since the 1650s has upheld the equality of women. The very existence of this institution disproves one of the main claims of the complementarian camp. They claim that this, e this idea of biblical equality between men and women is a new theology. They claim that it's a result of secular feminism infiltrating the church, but 200 years before the start of feminism in the United States, Quaker women were preaching and teaching and traveling as evangelists. And like those women, many of you women in here today are called to preach and teach and pastor and serve as elders in your church and we need you to. This world is in desperate need for women to follow their gifting and calling. Because this world that is so broken, that is having all these humanitarian crises, this world is hurting, and the humanitarian crises today are mostly affecting women. If you're not aware, according to the World Health Organization, the UN and US government sources, 70% of those living in poverty, poverty today are women. 100 to 200 million girls are missing from today's generation due to preference of sons over daughters, gender-based violence, and the killing of baby girls and fetuses. Rape is a primary weapon of war, especially in some African countries. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, it's estimated that 48 women are raped every hour. One third of the world's girls are married before the age of 18. One in nine are married before the age of 15. That's child marriages to adult men. More than, one, more than 125 million girls and women alive today have undergone female genital mutilation. Sex trafficking is thought to be the second largest criminal industry in the world, and over 80% of the victims are female. In the U.S., one in five women report having been raped, and seven in ten assaults against women are done by their intimate partner. That means their boyfriends, their ex-boyfriends, their husbands, or their ex-husbands. Women are in desperate need to hear the message that they too are created in the image of God, that they too are called to use their gifts in the church, that they too can serve and lead in the church. Because this world is broken. And those women need to hear that truth of Jesus Christ and his message for them. But many of us are scared by this debate and, and entering into it, and I have to say I understand that. I have looked into the eyes of a brother in Christ and been told that because I'm a woman, I should be seen and not heard. I have talked to fellow believers who have told me that because I'm a woman, I should not even be educated. I have listened to those, those messages that we have all listened to where, where popular pastors say that women, that men lead and women follow, that men teach and women listen, that men can take up space in whatever, whatever area of the church they want, be it worship team or pulpit or elder, 
but that women must shrink into the pews and shrink into the background and shrink into a ministry that's only really fit for children. And this matters. It matters because our words matter. Because women, we have grown up in a church culture where our worth and dignity are openly debated because they are not a given. But women, your worth and dignity is not determined by how well you fit into someone else's definition of biblical womanhood. They are not determined by getting married or having kids or learning to submit or staying quiet. And men, the same goes for you. Your worth and dignity are not found in someone else's definition of biblical manhood. They are not determined by how much money you make, what job you hold, and certainly not by your ability to exert power and authority over other people. Men and women, your, your worth and dignity were founded the day you were created in the image of the living God. Your place in the kingdom was solidified the moment that your sins were nailed to the cross that Christ died on and were defeated by the risen Christ. Your worth and dignity are not things to be debated because they are not things that can be lost. They're not things that, that, that can be taken away, and they're certainly not things that can be earned. They simply are. And if people in the church are telling you anything different, then they're wrong. And there really are a lot of things being said today about women in the church, aren't there? You hear them everywhere, from popular preachers, it's kind of like a, the general gist of evangelicalism seems to be a little bit anti-women in most areas. But I can't help but think every time I hear someone say something that tries to put women in their, women in their place, that that just doesn't fit with the life of Jesus. Because when you look at Jesus, you see something completely different. Jesus, who told a woman to spread the good news of his resurrection, but some in the church won't let a woman preach that from the pulpit. Jesus engaged in cross-gender discipleship, but some in the church teach that that's overly tempting or wrong. Jesus, who depended on the financial provision of women for the welfare of his ministry, but many in the church are teaching that it is men who are supposed to be the financial providers. Jesus used female examples in his stories and spoke about women in his teaching, but one popular evangelical preacher is saying that Christianity should have a masculine feel. A young woman carried the body and blood of Jesus within her for nine months, but some in the church won't let a woman serve communion in service. Jesus denied that there was hierarchy in his kingdom, but some are claiming that there is a hierarchy between men and women. If you are listening to the voices that are saying something that is opposite of what Jesus is saying, you're listening to the wrong voices. And you don't have to. You have the freedom in Christ to not listen to them, but to read and study and listen to the voices that seem to be in line with the life of Christ. Because just as Jesus told Mary Magdalene to preach the good news of his resurrection, he is calling you, men and women, today to do the same thing. So go and do. Preach the good news of the resurrection. Pastor a church. Lead God's people in the way that we should go because God has, has called you to do that. Do it because you've been gifted to do it. Do it because the church needs you to do it. And oh, how we need you to do that. And women, when you go and do, if they tell you that you need a man's covering to do so, you tell them that Jesus Christ died for you just as much as he died for anybody else, and his blood is the only covering that you need. And if they tell you that your husband should be leading you spiritually and should be making the last decision, you tell them that the day you became a Christian, you gave your life over to Christ, and that Christ is leading you spiritually, and that Christ has the last say in your life, and you're not gonna be giving that up to another human. And if they tell you that women are weak, you tell them that you come from a long line of godly women who led the army of Israel to victory, who saved God's people from genocide, and who birthed the savior of the world. And if they tell you that you're trying to just be like a man, 
you say, yes, I am. I'm trying to be like the man who died for me on a cross. I'm trying to be like the man who gave up his heavenly authority in order to be the servant of all. I'm trying to be like that poor Jewish carpenter turned preacher who turned away from the conventional in order to to preach the unconventional. I'm trying to be like that man who raised the status of women around him, who surrounded himself with men and women, and rich and poor, and educated and uneducated, and who died for them all. I'm trying to be like Jesus. I want to leave you with um, the words of one of my favorite thinkers. Her name is Dorothy Sayers, and she wrote at the same time as uh, C.S. Lewis and Tolkien. She joined the Inklings for a while, their writing club. And in her essay, Are Women Human? She says this. Perhaps it is no wonder that the women were first at the cradle and last at the cross. They had never known a man like this man. There never has been another. A prophet and teacher who never nagged at them, never flatter or co- flattered or coaxed or patronized, who never made arch jokes about them and never treated them either as the women, God help us, or the ladies, God bless them, who rebuked without querulousness and praised without condescension, who took their questions and arguments seriously, who never mapped out their sphere for them, and never urged them to be feminine or jeered at them for being female, who had no ax to grind and no uneasy male dignity to defend, who took them as he found them and was completely unselfconscious. There was no act, no sermon, no parable in the whole gospel that borrows its pungency from female perversity. Nobody could possibly guess from the words and deeds of Jesus that there was anything funny about a woman's nature. This is your first chapel after Easter. Remember the resurrection story that we just celebrated. Jesus defeats death, he rises again, and he comes to the women who came to the tomb, to Mary Magdalene and the others. And he told them the greatest news anyone would ever hear in all of history And he told them to go and tell the other disciples the good news. And do you remember what happened? They didn't believe them. And just like that, many of us women who have been told to tell this good news to other believers feel like they don't always take our messages. They don't always hear us. They don't always believe us. But just as Jesus defended the place of Mary, At Bethany, at his feet, as his disciple, he is defending your place as his disciple and your place in the kingdom. And that cannot be taken away from you. So live in the freedom of the resurrected Christ. Because that's what he came to do. Let me pray for us and then we can go. Gracious God, Jesus our Savior, Spirit, thank you for Easter. Thank you for Resurrection Sunday. Thank you for defeating death. Thank you for solidifying all of our places in your kingdom. Help us to believe the words that we sing in worship, that you will lead us into places without borders, You will help us actually walk among the waters and we can do whatever you call us to do, no matter who we are, male or female. Help us to believe your words and to live in your freedom. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.